as ter crime, but also terrorism. Uh, famous incidents where men, in many cases, are putting on the burqa in order to engage in some kind of uh, aggressive action. Well, that's a danger to society. You can't have individuals walking the streets, who knows, carrying a machine gun under there, and nobody has any idea. So I look at it as a public security issue. Now, we have laws on the books, for example, against the Ku Klux Klan, which where they didn't have all encompassing, but they were they were hid, their faces were hidden, and in order to prevent them from from you know, engaging in, in in terrorism effectively, uh, there were these laws that prevented them from walking around in under un, in disguise like that. And I think those should be reactivated and extended for the burqa. But I stay away from the cultural issues. I think they're too murky. I don't think it's necessary to go the cultural route when you have the security route very effective and great information provided because I've heard people denying that crimes are being committed, that any significant number, according to your research, well, there have been dozens. My website's danielpipes.org. Put in burqa, security threat, and you'll see documentation. Wonderful. Another issue, now we have a paper article. It just came out today, so I just got wind of it. Take a look at it on your screen. It's, it's called Canada Joins Crackdown on Radical Muslim Cleric. Now we've looked at the rise of radicalism in the West, particularly in Canada, on our program not long ago. What the article points out is that the RCMP is investigating this. This man is, what's terrifying about this man is, like others I'm seeing, he's targeting the young people. He boasts about his excellent command of the English language, um, his knowledge of the West, and apparently this is something that we're seeing more and more, that in our culture, once somebody can speak the language, once somebody has a smile, a good handshake, we automatically assume this must be an integrated Muslim. This cannot be a radical. And I'd like to know what your concerns are, if you have any, and thoughts about this. Well, sure. Anwar El Awlaki was born to Yemeni parents in the United States, is an American citizen, and uh, became an Islamist of a, of a very violent disposition. Not all Islamists are. He is. He actually had some role in 9-11, but he was allowed to leave the country, a subject which is still contentious. And he returned to his native, or his parents' native uh, Yemen where he has become quite a presence. And because he is a native English speaker, an American citizen, someone who knows his way around the West and the United States in particular, he has an appeal that other, you know, say, Bin Laden, Bin Laden is not conversant with our ways. Uh, he has an anger and a knowledge and a sophistication uh, that, that draws to him other Islamists who are seeking inspiration and guidance and uh, he has repeatedly been connected first in the United States and now apparently in Canada with terrorists and would-be terrorists. He is a motivating force behind them. And there has recently been issued a, uh, a warrant for him that in fact, which is very unusual, says that American forces can kill him. And it's not usually the case that American forces can kill a fellow American abroad. This is, this is something new. You know, the, the terms of war are changing. We're yes. not dealing with, uh, you know, armies with uh, soldiers wearing uniforms. We're dealing with, uh, from foreign countries, dealing with something quite different, where borders and nationalities and the like are less important than ideology. Do you see this changing tone of war, the war on terror as we see, as a major issue considering the fact that we really have no, the Geneva Convention does not include this war on terror. Back in 2003, George Bush had indicated it's a guideline when it comes to policy, but it really has nothing hard and fast to include such a war as this. Well, international law vis-a-vis -vis war is outdated, but so is much else. There's, we could spend the whole hour on this subject. I'll give you just one example. The term victory is gone from the military vocabulary. People don't talk about victory anymore. And yet that always was throughout history. The goal of an army was to win. Now it's to find some position from which you can compromise. Goodness. I, I mean, look at, look at our soldiers in Afghanistan. They're engaged in social work. They're engaged in winning hearts and minds. They're not, they're, very, they're not basically there to win a war. They're there to improve. A lot of them are engaged in, in especially in, even more so in Iraq than Afghanistan. They've been, uh, they've been engaged in you know, fixing waterworks and electricity grids, working with tribes, 
writing constitutions, fixing schools. That's not what war has traditionally been understood as. With Multicultural Canada, which under the Multicultural Act deems all cultures equal, do you have an issue with this? Mm, do I? Uh, as a representation of English and French Canada, I'd like to look at Britain and France, which I think are, which I know better and which are clear. But I think those same features work in Canada too. Uh, Britain is a great country with wonderful history and culture. But the British tend to feel guilty for racism and imperialism and tend to have a multicultural approach, you know, which means it's all the same. Uh, I like to use the analogy, shall we go to dinner tonight, Japanese or Italian? It's all good food, it all fills you. It doesn't really make a difference. And thus, they look more profoundly at culture. It doesn't really make a difference if it's Bangladeshi or English. In France, in contrast, there is a sense of French culture. Uh, and that if you're coming to France, you should adapt to French culture. And I think something like that applies in Canada. And I believe that the French approach, although I have issues with the French on many, many levels, but I think this sense of confidence and pride in French culture is extremely important. I think if you jump ahead a few decades and look how Britain and France are going to look, it will be very different. And I think the French will be better off. One wants to have knowledge and pride in who one is, and one's culture. And so I think by analogy, I think Quebec will be better off than the rest of Canada because it knows what it is in a way the rest of Canada does not. In that grain, you wrote an article called Rushdie Rules. And in that particular article, you, you start with what had taken place with Rushdie, what has developed since. But also in that article, you include the developments that have taken place in Britain that many people aren't aware of. Um, what, ref what you can refer to as the infiltration of Islamism. Give us some insight here. Well, in 1989, the Ayatollah Khomeini thundered an edict against Salman Rushdie, a, a Indian Muslim who was li already living in London for some time. And he'd written a book that had quite a bit to do with Islam. And it was pretty blasphemous. And the, the Ayatollah said, this man needs to be killed. And this was a shock to Rushdie himself, to all of us, everyone. No one had done anything like this before. I mean, uh, Rushdie had almost no ties to Iran. Who was the Ayatollah to deem him worthy of death? Well, there was some pushback, not an awful lot, but there was some. For example, the U.S. Senate voted unanimously to support Rushdie, and the, uh, many, many governments took a stand on it. It was deemed unacceptable. But the long-term impact of this 1989 event was to galvanize Muslims to feel that, yeah, if you say something or do something that we deem an insult, you'll pay for it. And uh, al Awlaki, who we were just talking about uh, just days ago, came out with a statement saying that Molly Norris, an American cartoonist, who came up with the idea of everybody draw Muhammad Day, should be executed for that. It's become kind of standard. No one even notices anymore. And there's a, a wall around Islam and related topics. People are scared of it. And you find over and over again, I've been documenting this as well, I find over and over again that artists and writers and politicians and journalists say, oh, I don't want to talk about Islam because they're scared. Uh, this is a profound development. Now, it's usually looked at in terms of freedom of speech, and it is certainly a freedom of speech issue. But I think it goes a lot deeper. Yes, freedom of speech about Islam is important. But much more important than that is that if you can't talk openly about Islam, you can't critique anything. And I, uh, I am critiquing the Islamist attempt to change Western countries and make them, uh, uh, make them adapt to Islamic law. I'm against that. I'm against, say, the harem in the West. I'm against uh, cutting of hands. I'm against, I'm against the Sharia. But if this, these Rushdie rules apply to me, I can't talk about it. You can't ask me about it. The viewers can't see it. And those rules will come all the easier and faster. So I think it's not just important as freedom of speech. It's important to maintain our way of life. If we can't talk about it, we can't protect ourselves. We've been hearing about Muslim enclaves in the West. 
how serious.